All right, so tonight um, I'm going to talk about emptiness, which is one of these words that you start encountering a lot when you start reading about Buddhism, and, and it can be kind of confusing. So uh, we'll try to demystify it a little bit tonight. The confusion is partly because this term emptiness is used in different ways, in different contexts within Buddhism. Um, but part of it, too, is that emptiness is one of those things that you really kind of have to put into practice in order to know what it really means. There was a great Thai meditation master named Ajahn Chah who did a lot of uh, teaching Americans who went to Thailand to study meditation. And he would say that if you try to understand emptiness with your intellect, your head will explode. <laughs> and it's not really quite that bad, but it is something that you, you have to work with a little bit to really get the importance of it. But, um, that aside, we're going to talk about it anyway. And, um, and, and I want to start by reading you a sutra that's kind of basic and integral to a whole lot of Buddhists. But pretty much if you're a Mahayana Buddhist, which is most Buddhists are Mahayana Buddhists, um, you're going to encounter this sutra. And it's referred to as the Heart Sutra, uh, which is kind of short for it's really the heart of the Great Wisdom Sutra. So there's this big long sutra called the Great uh, Wisdom Sutra, or the Perfection of Great Wisdom Sutra, rather. And this rather short s excerpt from it is considered to be the heart of that sutra. It's kind of the most important teaching in that sutra. So if you, if you ever go to services at White Sands, we always chant it. Uh, when, it's part of what we do at the prison every Tuesday. We always, we, we do some chanting and we always do this particular sutra. And once in a while we'll do it here as part of a regular service, uh, special services. So uh, here it is. Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva doing deep pranya paramita perceived the emptiness of all five conditions and was freed from pain. O Shariputra, form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form. Form is precisely emptiness, emptiness precisely form. Feelings, perceptions, cognitions, and consciousness are also like this. O Shariputra, all things are expressions of emptiness. Not born, not destroyed, not stained, not pure, neither waxing nor waning. Thus emptiness is not form, not sensation or perception, reaction or consciousness, no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, no color, sound, smell, taste, touch, thing, no realm of sight, no realm of consciousness, no ignorance, no end to ignorance, no old age and death, no cessation of old age and death, no suffering, no cause or end to suffering, no path, no wisdom, and no gain, no gain. Thus bodhisattvas live this perfection of wisdom with no hindrance of mind, no hindrance, therefore, no fear. Far beyond all such delu delusion, nirvana is already here. All past, present, and future Buddhas live in this wisdom and attain supreme perfect enlightenment. Therefore know that Pranya Paramita is the holy mantra, the luminous mantra, the supreme mantra, the incomparable mantra by which all suffering is clear. This is no other than truth. Therefore set forth the Prajna, Pranya Paramita Mantra, set forth this mantra and proclaim Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gati Bodhisvaha. And all the people who are newcomers and are just <laughs> being introduced to Buddhism are sitting there going, what in the world did that man just say? <laughs> but it's okay, we're going to unpack this. There's a lot in here. Um, and, and actually at home I have four different books <laughs> on this particular teaching. There's one by the Dalai Lama, one by Thich Nhat Hanh, one by Venerable Kai Tien, who's the abbot of uh, White Sands Buddhist Center, and there's one by Gyome Kabose, who's the spiritual head of uh, uh, Bright Dawn, which is the, my ministry tradition. And there's others out there, too. I, and I'll probably write one one of these days, too. But um, uh, the thing is, this is really... You know, it's, it's very poetic. It's not something you're going to get on first reading. Um, you have to understand at least a little bit so that you can start practicing it. And then as you practice it, it starts to open up for you. So I'm going to kind of barely scratch the surface because I only want to talk for about 20 minutes. 
And so that's just enough to kind of get us going. And this is one of those things that you encounter in Buddhism. That when you, when you try to approach it intellectually, it can seem very overwhelming. But Buddhism's a practice, and it's a practice that will take you through the rest of your life and, and possibly other lifetimes as well. And so you take one thing at a time. So we're going to take the first bite of an elephant. Okay, you know you could eat it a whole elephant if you wanted to, but you got to do it one bite at a time. You can't swallow it whole. So we're gonna we're gonna start with this idea of emptiness. So the sutra says that the bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, who is the the bodhisattva of compassion, is kind of like a saint in Buddhism, perceived emptiness. And so first, what does it mean to say that something's empty? Um, this is a good time to take a drink of water. If I was to drink all the water out of this glass, I could say, well, this glass is empty. And somebody would probably say, no, it's not, because it's got air in it. And I have to admit that you're right, you know. And so we might agree that the glass would be empty of water, but it's not empty of air. So when we talk about emptiness, we have to ask empty of what? What is not present here? And then we can accurately agree on it. So we've got a couple of different ways we talk about emptiness. And one is emptiness as an approach to meditation. Um, in, and when we're talking about emptiness that way, we mean the mind being sort of empty of disturbance. And the Buddha explained this concept in a, in a dialogue he had with his cousin Ananda. Ananda was a really, really bright guy. and We have the Buddha's teachings. Largely thanks to Ananda. He was one of those guys who could remember anything he heard. And the Buddha was taught for 45 years after his enlightenment. And Ananda was there for a lot of that. And he remembered everything. And so, so a lot of these discourses come from talks that either Ananda was involved in or that he witnessed. But anyway, the Buddha was talking to Ananda. And they were staying in a monastery. And the Buddha starts out by saying that in this monastery is empty of the disturbances associated with the village. So, you know, there were no elephants, there were no merchants there, no crowds of people and so on. So the monastery was empty of all of these things, all of these disturbances. And so he says a monk meditating here only has to contend with the lesser disturbances that come from living in a monastery. And then he said if the monk wanted to, he could go out into a forest and he could sit down under a tree and he could meditate there. Because the forest is empty of all the disturbances that arise in a monastery. You know, monks going around chanting and people coming to, to make offerings and all those kinds of things that happen in monasteries, those aren't going on. So now there's just those disturbances that are associated with being in the forest. Which might not seem like very much, but I've got a Thai friend named uh, Tan Rong San. He used to be the vice abbot at Wat Florida Dhammaram Kissimmee. And he was talking once about doing walking meditation in the forest in Thailand when he was still a forest monk there. And he was uh, talking about, uh, as he was, they do walking meditation basically pacing back and forth and you're just mindfully concentrating on your steps. And he started to smell a tiger. And he said, I could smell the tiger. I knew the tiger was there, but I couldn't tell from smelling it whether it was a hungry tiger or not. <laughs> and I couldn't tell whether it was a big tiger or not. And so he said, so I just kept doing my walking meditation. Well, what else is there to do? So he just kept doing his meditation. So even though there was a tiger there, he actually became empty of disturbance about the tiger. And so this is, when we use emptiness as an approach to meditation, this is the kind of thing we do. We can become empty of disturbances about the things that arise around us. So, uh, in a wilderness, monk can set aside, empty himself of any disturbance about the wilderness and just concentrate on earth. And then the mind can become empty of any disturbance relative to the earth. And you can focus on the infinitude of consciousness and continue on and emptying everything out until you basically realize pure emptiness and you find release. But that's not really what Avalokiteshvara is talking to Saraputra about in this 
Sutra that I just read you. He's talking about emptiness as an attribute of existence. And so he says the Bodhisattva was deeply absorbed in penetration of understanding. He said, he, says, uh, he was absorbed in, in, in pranyaparamita, doing deep pranyaparamita, which means perfecting wisdom. And while he was meditating, using his insight to discern the nature of reality, he observed the five aggregates and he found them equally empty. And we talked about the five aggregates last week. And we talked about the doctrine of not-self. And Buddhism recognizes that there's no one thing that we say is intrinsically self. That the self is made up of form and feelings, perceptions, of reactions, consciousness, those things. And those things are constantly changing. And Avalokiteshvara was observing this and he noticed that those five things were themselves empty. So not only was he empty of a self because what we generally perceive of as a self is really constantly changing processes of all these different form and formless things, but those things themselves don't have any intrinsic existence. And then he goes on and says, all things are expressions of emptiness. So they're not born, not destroyed, not stained, not pure, neither waxing nor waning. Everything else is empty of an intrinsic self. So since, since there's a lot of people here tonight who weren't here last week, I'm going to kind of back up a little bit and talk about this idea of no intrinsic self. We tend to think, okay, this is me. Has some finite beginning and end, uh, you know, certain boundaries that are, you know, we're I, stop, and that sort of thing. But when we look carefully, we see that there's a physical form, and then there's attributes that are formless. And the technical term in Buddhism is uh, Nama Rupa. Rupa is form, and Nama means name. In other words, it's stuff that can be named, but you can't really see it. So, sensation. I can feel myself sitting on my cushion right now. I can't show you that feeling. Okay? It's just, it's, it's something that I can name, I can tell you what it is and all that, but I can't show it to you. Uh, and then there's uh, perception of, you know, if I see something or hear something, something comes in through the sense door, the eye, the ear, touch, whatever. And the brain or the mind interprets it, says what it is. So I'm walking down the street and I see a, a person walking down the sidewalk toward me, for example. I recognize that that's a human being there. Um, and then there's reactions to that. So suppose I see somebody stumbling down the street toward me. And I might think, oh, that, that must be a drunk. You know, or something like that. This is this somebody I should avoid. I'm going to cross the street and get away from. Them. Okay. I'm fabricating that drunkenness. Okay. It might really be a sick person. Maybe he just got hit by a car or something like that. You know, and he needs help or whatever. But my mind is interpreting things based on experiences that I've had before and based on some kind of hardwiring from past karma, cotton causes and conditions that brought me into this particular moment. And it's interpreting what's happening. So those are mental fabrications. We tend to ascribe a lot of reality to them. But really they're things that we make in our mind. And then there's consciousness. There's awareness of what's going on. There's awareness that I might feel a certain sense of revulsion from seeing this or whatever. Awareness of what's being seen, what's being felt, what's being reacted to. These things are all constantly in change and they don't really belong to me. Now you think this is my body, but this body is constantly in change and it's made up of other stuff. So I'm sitting here breathing. You're sitting there breathing. We're exchanging molecules. Okay? There's stuff you walked in the door with that's not yours anymore. Some of it's mine, some of it belongs to the person next to you now, okay? Also, if something is really yours, you have a certain amount of control over it, right? How much control do you have over your body? Not nearly as much as you would like to have. 
If it was your body, would it age? Okay. Would it get sick? Not mine. <laughs> okay. So it's proof <laughs> that it's not my body because this body is subject to all kinds of things that if it was really mine, I wouldn't let it be subject to. I wouldn't let it get old. I wouldn't let it get sick. I wouldn't let it die. None of that stuff. Okay. And so really what's happening then is we've got this set of causes and conditions that kind of come together and fall apart and change and morph and all of that. And we think, oh, this is me. Right? This is really interesting stuff to think about. But being interesting to think about is not what Buddhism is. Buddhism is about suffering and the end of suffering. So how does this idea of self affect whether I suffer or not, whether I experience stress or not? Well, what if you think this self of yours has to be perfect? perfect? Okay, Isn't that perfectionism? You think I need to be perfect? Okay. If I screw up, that's really, really bad. And not only that, but I'm a bad person because I screwed up. What about other people? When we think that they have a self, we suddenly identify with some, something and say they're a bad person. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. What do you think about that person at that point? Right? You've just created a self around one little moment in time. That person could be, you know, Mother Teresa. But because she cuts you off in traffic, <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of other words that you call her other than saying, right? Sure. So <clears throat> this is how we use this kind of false sense of self and self of others to create stress and suffering for ourselves. So um, because all thing all because all things are made up of other stuff, because they're constantly in change, then, then we have this idea that comes up in Buddhism, interdependence. So, look at this book, for example. Okay, you see a book. But there's a lot of different things that had to happen before this book could be here. So, for example, trees. You don't look at this and see a tree. But you know, if you think about it, that books come from, are made out of paper and paper comes from trees or various recycled things that were probably trees at one point, right? Um, and what it, where do trees come from? Trees come out of the, uh, stuff out of the ground, nutrients that are absorbed out of the soil, carbon and things like that, stuff that comes out of the air, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, all those things, water, sun, sunlight. So you look at this book and you don't see trees and you don't see sunshine and you don't see water and you don't, don't see all that stuff, but they're there. Okay. We just don't see them because we identify this thing as being a discrete, concrete thing. When really it's just a point in time of a whole bunch of processes, right? So because of this, when you start really kind of looking past this present moment uh, identification of something as a self, then you can use that awareness to start transcending a lot of your stress. So uh, there's, a, there's a teacher that I like a lot. He's an abbot of a Thai temple out in California. His name's Tanisara Bhikkhu. And he said something that I really like. He's talking about wisdom. He says, we can measure our wisdom by the extent we can get ourselves to do things that we don't like to do, but that we know will lead to happiness. And to the extent that we can refrain from things we like doing, but we know will lead to harm. And I really like that idea because I, I think that that's a big part of what goes on in Buddhism is recognizing that there's things I really like, but I get more out of letting go of them than I do clinging to them. And there's things I really don't like, but I get more out of accepting them than I do out of pushing them away. So when we follow this train of thought about emptiness, see where that teaching gets us, how does it do that? Then you, then you start to see the relationship of things and how these stresses come about. So uh, in this case, Avalokiteshvara realized this, realized 
how suffering came from being attached to this idea of selfness and from thinking that other things had inherent existence and then letting go of that. So, we don't like the idea of letting go of our ego. We don't think it's going to bring us pleasure. But when we start to realize the emptiness of a lot of what we're clinging to, then we're able to loosen the grip of that clinging and start letting go of stuff that's holding us back spiritually. So, and this is where the idea of oneness comes in. We realize that we look carefully at what's going on, what we think of as a self. We see there's really no separation between myself and other selves. And so this is when you can start putting the Heart Sutra into practice. You live it, you become one with it. And then armed with that wisdom, then you can start moving toward realizing your Buddha nature. <clears throat> and I'll talk about Buddha nature another night. But, um, you know, sometimes at a cocktail party, somebody will say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm part Jewish and part Cherokee. And somebody else will say, oh, yeah, oh, that's neat. Well, I'm, I'm part Inuit and part Swedish, you know, or whatever. And you go through that. Well, next time you're in one of those situations, you can say, oh, I'm part grub worm and part Mack truck. Okay? Because you are. You're part all of that and a bunch of other stuff, too. So, how do you put this into practice? Part of it is you realize how supported you are, how, how tied you are to everything in the world that you live in. And part of it is you can do a really simple thing, which we do here. We put our hands together. We call this gasho in Japanese. The Indian name for it is Anjali. So we can become one with one another just by gasho. That's what, that's what we mean when we gasho. It's a form of respect, but it's a gesture that represents oneness. One palm is the subject, the other is the object. They come together in one movement. So, through Gasha, if you think about it, this dualism, this artificial separation that we impose with our names and, you know, this idea of myself and yourself that we start to impose, we can transcend that and become one with one another. When we bow to the Buddha, we're one with the Buddha. If I Gasha to you, I'm one with you. And you, but you don't gasho with your hands. That's where the gesture happens. It's really gasho with your heart. So I think it's kind of a closing exercise. Why don't you all stand up? <coughs> and just face somebody. And put your hands together and gasho. Here, you can gasho with me. <laughs> Here, okay. Yeah, from there, it's just fine. All right, just put your hands together just a little bow. And that's just acknowledging that oneness. Okay, thank you. Like I said, you know, put these, start putting these things into practice. When you start feeling yourself stressed, go, okay, where is this idea that there's a me and a you coming from? Where does that create stress? And when you start looking at it that way, you'll start to, you know, that kind of helps put that into perspective. These things, when you approach them intellectually, they can be very interesting stuff, but you can just run in circles in your mind around them. When you start, stop and go, okay, how does this make me hurt? Okay, and how can, how can putting this into practice make me not hurt? Then that's where it starts to have its real value. No, um, thought is not a bad thing. The um, cognitions are are a part of the process. You know, you've got those those four aspects of self that are not form, and one of them is is cognitions. You know, reactions, memories, and things like that. But some thoughts can get in the way of your realization of them. Like I said, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic and suddenly you define them <coughs> based on that moment. Okay. Then, yeah, you're not realizing the emptiness of that situation because you just built this, this picture of them based around that one thing that happened. Or same thing, you know, if you got up to gave a speech and 
discovered your fly was unzipped, you know, and then you spend the rest of your life worrying about that, right? So one little moment in time that just influenced your sense of self for the next, you know, 30 years or whatever. So um, that's, in that sense, some thoughts do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, you know, a couple of things. Is this thought in keeping with reality? We know that life has difficulties. We know that all compounded things are impermanent, and subject to change. We know that there's no inherent self. And we know that life is ultimately good, although we talk about that next week. <laughs> but we do know this. So, when you look at the thought and you go, okay, is it in line with that? And then we also know that, as you know, as, as the Buddha said, he, he said when he was beginning, to, when he set out on his path, he said, I noticed that some of my thoughts led to stress and some of them led, didn't lead to stress. Some of them led to happiness, some of them didn't lead to happiness. And so I started so basically sorting my thoughts into two kinds, those that led away from stress and toward happiness and those that led to more stress and less happiness. And so you kind of look at that and go, well, the thoughts that I, I want to cultivate are the ones that make sense in terms of reality and that don't create suffering, or don't lead to suffering. Again, you know, if, if, if you had the belief that it was raining outside and so you didn't go outside, you know, you deprived yourself of something that you wanted to do because you it sounded like it was raining. And then you found that really, you know, somebody was standing on the roof shaking some sheet metal, so it sounded like it was thundering. It was really a beautiful day outside. Well, if you looked at that carefully, you'd say, well, I shouldn't have given that thought much weight because it wasn't in keeping with reality. It, it didn't get me where I wanted to go, which was out to the, you know, the art festival or whatever, right? The same thing with this. If I'm thinking that, uh, you know, I have to always be perfect. I've created this, this idea of a self that has to be perfect. When the reality is I'm a human being, I'm made up of compounded things, everything's going to change, there's no real me, etc. So it's not in keeping with, with reality. And number two, if I think I always have to be perfect, what's going to happen when I have an opportunity to go into a situation where I'm very likely to fail? not going to do it. I'm not going to take the risk. So you make less progress because you're less willing to take the risk because if you failed it would be terrible to prove how imperfect you are. So you don't put much weight on those thoughts. Well, good feelings pass just like bad feelings pass. Sure. You know, one of the things we learn in meditation, sometimes a real blissful feeling will arise. We're trying to make long-term spiritual progress with meditation. If you start clinging to that blissful feeling, what happens? It goes away. Okay. Even if you manage to cultivate it and you stay in that blissful feeling, you may, if you don't let it just sort of naturally pass away on its own, then you're not going to ex get to experience the next thing, which is a deeper jhana, which is blissful in a different way, and leads you to greater insight, ultimately, right? So two problems with wanting to cling, cling to the blissful feeling. One is you're meditating, you go, boy, I sure hope I have that blissful feeling like I had last time, and then, it, and then you guarantee that it doesn't happen. And two, you get stuck in this first jhana state of bliss when you could have gone on to the second jhana, and the third jhana, and so on, which leads you to greater stages of clarity. that other kind of emptiness that we're talking about, which actually relates to what you said too. When you start letting, you know, there are disturbances of the, when we're looking at meditation, there's disturbances that come from thought. When you have less and less disturbing thoughts, then you're empty of, of the greater disturbances, but eventually you get less and less thought period. So even the non-disturbing thoughts subside and you get that 
level of emptiness. That makes sense? 